Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first virtual urban garden workshop. Today's session is about managing your summer garden. My name is Linda Maxwell. I'm the program manager at the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum, and we are happy to have you to join us today for another program. Um, happy Saturday to you all. For those of you who are joining us for our first garden workshop, these programs grew out of the museum's exhibition, Reclaiming the Edge, Urban Waterways in 2012. And since that time, our museum has been focused on environmental aspects of the local waterways. And before we begin, I would like to know mention the rules of engagement. After the speaker will speak 15 to 20 minutes, make sure you type your questions in the chat and we will try to answer as many as possible. I would like to welcome my colleague here at the museum, Katrina Lashley, and she can tell you more about today's program and talk about the Urban Waterways Project at the museum. Welcome to Katrina. Thank you for joining us this Saturday. Hi, Linda. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, for our, um, our, you know, our hardcore um, attendees over the past, almost I would say a decade or so, we're very happy to be with you again. For our new attendees, welcome very much um, to our virtual space. As Linda mentioned, my name is Katrina Lashley. I'm the program coordinator for Urban Waterways at ACM. And before we bring Derek on, I just wanted to give you all um, a brief overview of the Urban Waterways project and how um, the Urban Garden Work series, um, Workshop Series came to be. So Urban Waterways is now entering its 10th year. Um, and really it's a project that examines relationships between urban um, rivers and their communities. And as Dr. Gail Lowe, who conceived the project and led it until 2015, this project really is about people and their ongoing connections to urban waterways and by extension, the natural world. And so we operate from the understanding that um, urban communities um, are engaged with the natural world in a variety of ways, they define the relationship to the natural world in a variety of ways. Um, and they're willing to be engaged with their natural world in a variety of ways. And so we've moved beyond the traditional, I would say, expected lens of science, not to dismiss it, not to push it aside, but to place science um, in the larger context of lives as they're lived um, along these waterways in various communities, locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and so we understand that people are willing to understand their relationship through the lens of history, culture, art, faith, questions of equity, class, race, injustice, power, politics, public health, uh, and so forth. And so our, our main goal, our first goal really is to break down silos that have been kind of constructed around the various disciplines, but also the silos that have been created around community experiences, different streams of knowledge. So how do we bring everyone to the same table, either you know, physical or virtual spaces to kind of bring their experiences and their knowledge and their understanding of these various waterways and how can people share the best practices, um, the best tools for really kind of advocating for healthier communities and healthier um, waterways. Our second main goal really has been to document as much as possible the various experiences of the stakeholders who live in these communities on these waterways. Um, it's a way really of, I think, broadening the historical record. So if you are um, a member of local government, if you're a historian, if you're a scientist, if you've been leading cleanups along your waterways in your parks since you were a teenager, um, if you lived in your community ever since you were born, if you're an artist, if you're, you know, you have these amazing gardens along these waterways in your communities, we want to hear your story told from your point of view and add it to this larger growing archive of histories along the Anacostia River, but also rivers in communities such as LA, Gulfport, Biloxi, Pittsburgh, on Oahu, London, and so forth. And our third main goal really um, has been to engage anyone who's interested in these topics, these issues, and variety of programming. So as Linda mentioned, we had our exhibition, we've had ongoing workshops, community forums, ongoing newsletter, summits, and this urban gardening series. And we found that this holistic approach really has, I would say, questioned and challenged um, the traditional definitions of the environment. Who is an environmentalist? What does environmentalism look like? Um, who, what is it stewardship? Is it kinship? Um, kind of challenge narratives that certain communities are not interested in engaging with the natural world and that, you know, there's only one proper way to engage with steward with the natural world. And we find that for many communities, we understand that, you know, it really is about advocacy. 
It really is about claiming your right to um, having access to natural spaces, be it blue space, green space, um, healthy air, and just really um, a healthy, sustainable way of life. And so about nine years ago, uh, my colleague Linda Maxwell created this gardening series um, with Derek Thomas um, as a way of kind of, I would say, a how-to of gardening, the practical steps of gardening, but also inviting our attendees to think about this idea of reclaiming our green spaces. How is that really an act of community, an act of empowerment, and how really um, is something that has been a part of um, various cultures you know, we all know someone who gardens, right? Either it's our mom, our dad, our uncle, our aunt, our grandparents, a neighbor. And how does that sense of being in these green spaces give us a connection to a sense of place, to a sense of empowerment, a sense of, you know, um, making decisions about the food we put into our bodies, um, the relationships that we build, the mentorships that can take place in these green spaces. And so our goal really for this, um, these garden workshops, both in person and virtual is once again, Gardening is something that's accessible, whether you have a backyard, a patio, a windowsill, um, and garden really is a way of kind of reclaiming a cultural, ecological um, heritage and culture, and as a way of entering some really kind of conversations about access to healthy eating, access to quality of life, um, access to strengthening not only our physical bodies, but also our emotional and mental lives. And so we invite you to continue to join us um, for these workshops. And I would like to kind of welcome Derek Thomas, um, who has been a partner for almost a decade. Um, Derek has led these workshops from the very beginning. I call him an encyclopedia of anything to having to do with the garden. And so Derek, we welcome you to take the lead. Hey, thank you, Katrina. Welcome everyone. Um, we're here in the garden. Um, I wanted to uh, start, it's been really, really hot lately. Um, and I wanted to start uh, uh, right here actually at this grove of salvia that we have because in spite of the heat, the honeybees, as you can see, are buzzing around. Uh, they're collecting their nectar. Um, they're doing what they are supposed to do. And us as gardeners have to get out, even in the summer heat, and do what we need to do. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss before we even get things started today was not only about the heat, but the benefits of watering when we've had excessive amounts of heat like we've had, and also mulch. I'm walking on a bed of mulch right here. And um, putting down mulch not only helps to protect the soil, protects from erosion, but it also helps to insulate the soil so that you don't water as much. We're going to head down into the main part of the vegetable garden. Uh, today we're really talking about some of the housekeeping things that we need to do. Uh, we're going to be talking about harvesting. We're going to be talking about what to do with spent plants. Um, and I wanted to head over to the beans first. We did uh, pole beans this year and the foot long beans. When you are harvesting your plants, one of the important things that you want to try to do is to continue to get yield because these beans, these are yard long beans and they are a wonderful bean. Uh, you cut them up, you would saute them. But off of this little point right here, are where future flowers are gonna come. So if you cut all of this off, the bean plant is going to have to expend an excessive amount of energy to produce another flowering tip. As you see here, this is one where we harvested some beans and it's about to flower again. So the best way to harvest these beans are just to twist them like this in your hand and go along anywhere that you have them, twist the beans off, they're, you know, sometimes they're a little bit lower, trying to try to check your, your harvest. And you wanna leave this tip in place because the new flowers are gonna come out of there. And that is really the money part of the plant. And you don't want the plant to waste a lot of energy making more. Let's head over to the cucumbers. The cucumbers have been very, very good this year. Um, and what happened was with the excessive amount of rain that we had over the last couple of days, they've really loved it. So we've got, I'm gonna switch my sides here. We've got these Asian cucumbers that are literally, they're, 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 they're weighted down with water. They're really good. What I did here was I cut, but made sure that I didn't cut the rest of the vine because the rest of the vine has flowers. It's going to produce more plants. I mean, not more plants, more uh, fruit. Um, so I'm gonna take maybe one more 
here's a really nice big one here. And you don't have, if you like your cucumbers more immature, you don't have to wait until they get this large to harvest. Now, in this area, I have a mix of peppers. I have something that the West Indians that are with us is known as Shadow Benny, but it's also culantro, uh, not cilantro, culantro. Um, I also have a broadleaf oregano, which is also a tropical oregano. Oregano is cold hardy in this area, but not the broadleaf oregano. When you're harvesting your oregano or your culantro, and even your peppers, you want to make sure that you harvest them correctly so that you will continue to get yield. And the way to do that, I'm going to start with the cilantro. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with the broadleaf oregano. What you're going to do is, this is really very, very nice, but what you want to do is look down in here where it's got the baby plants coming off, and you can cut it right there. You can cut it again right here. And you want to reduce the size of the plant, but you also want to leave enough of the plant in place that you can get future yield. Now this is more than enough to share with friends if you wanted to put it in a bag in the refrigerator, put it in a bag, do not wash it until you're ready to use it. If you wash it, the water will make it go bad quicker. If you put this in a bag in the refrigerator, a Ziploc bag, um, it will stay fresh for well over a month while you're using it in your refrigerator. If you add water to it, it'll last maybe a week. As we come around here, this is the culantro, or like I said, uh, West Indians will know this, or people from the Caribbean will know this as shadow benny. What you wanna do is, and I did some of it before, you don't want it to go to seed because when it goes to seed, this is the same plant. When it goes to seed, it loses what we want, which is actually the leaves. So what you want to do, and it's, it's a little bit, it does stick, but you want to get in there. You want to clean all of this off as part of what you're doing to ensure that this plant is going to continue to produce a good harvest for you. So this stuff can be added to your compost bin. And then what you wanna do when you're harvesting your shadow benny, each plant comes out of, here's a, here's a young one, you can see this. It starts off like this and then it produces babies off of itself. You can actually take the plant, cut it down like this. I know it looks harsh, but this is what you want for soups, for that people will use it in, uh, different recipes, different Caribbean recipes. It's very, very, very aromatic. And this is what you actually want to be using um, as, as, you know, for your, for your, for your, um, for your recipes. This part is going to grow back. So we want to leave that. And we can do each one of those like that. The hot peppers. The interesting thing about hot peppers, hot peppers tend to overproduce, whereas your green peppers tend to underproduce. What I like to do with hot peppers at this time of the year is find the limbs that are weighing down the plant a little bit too much. And I will actually go in and remove that limb. Now, what that's done is the center of the plant is still producing heavily. So we're leaving that, but we're removing this outer limb because this outer limb tends to weigh the plant down. And then you would harvest your hot peppers off of the plant. The actual leaves of the plant, once again, could be turned into your compost. And there. Also this, if anybody's wondering, this is um, perilla, which is a wonderful, uh, it's used a lot in Asian cuisine and in sushi. This is the purple perilla. And this is wonderful. If you wanted to harvest any of your perilla, basically you cut it and you leave the part that you're not going to use. Now, 
Now, we talked about the big leaf oregano. There's also the small leaf oregano. This is a great time of year to do some house cleaning and as a benefit also get a little bit of oregano for your cooking. This plant I call the mother plant because it's had, it's produced a lot of babies for me. But what I did several months ago was I pruned back most of it. All of this young stuff that's coming in is what is now fresh and new and coming in. Any place that this hits the ground, it's gonna root and it's gonna produce new babies. This one is a different type of oregano. You can tell by the, the lighter color here, but also we gave it a good haircut. The woody areas were trimmed back and now it's flushing back out. When you go to trim back your oregano, don't be afraid. You can take this back you can take all of this woody stuff off. This can be stored into a uh, Ziploc bag. Don't wash it until you're ready to use it because once again, the water will make it go bad. And this is part of our harvest. Now, this looks kind of woody and gnarly. Anything that's obviously dead, you want to remove. But this, we've just renewed the, the plant and the plant is going to be ready to go. And this, is a youngster. As you can see, it hasn't gotten real woody yet, but if you wanted to keep it controlled or contain it because you have a limited amount of space, this is also a time that you can get in there and prune out any of the parts that are not where you want them to be. Basil, everybody loves basil. We do our basil in pots. Um, container gardens have become all the rave. The nice thing about basil is that it is also, like the perilla plant, they're, they're cousins, basil is one of the plants that you can do a really good renewal prune to, and it will come back out. So we can take a plant like this, we can go in, find the main stalk, remove the main stalk, Because after all, this is what we want in our pesto. And if you have a little piece like this, go ahead and take that off too, because what this is going to do is the plant's going to give this more energy, and this is going to come shooting straight up. What I want to see is the plants return back to nice and evenly full like this, because then I get a really good harvest of basil. Wash that off with basil. What you do is you don't put it in a plastic bag. You would actually wash it off. You would clean any of the lower leaves like this. And then you would put this in water. And if you put this in water, you can harvest leaves as you need it, unless you're making pesto, and then of course you would harvest all of the leaves. But if you put this in water, this will root, and you will be able to harvest basil for as many days as there are leaves. This year is my first year doing shishito peppers. Shishito peppers have become all the rave, and I'm really pleased with my shishito pepper plant. However, leaving these peppers on, what started to happen is that my blossoms have stopped setting, so they're not setting fruit anymore. But what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead, harvest my shishito peppers. I don't wanna do like what I did with my uh, chili peppers, my hot peppers, because the chili peppers, as I said, they overgrow. The shishito peppers are a more limited yield. And so if I cut this, this part off, I'm not going to get as many new peppers as I will from those hot um, chili peppers. But I'm going to go ahead and take a couple more of these off. And what I'll do is I'll finish up pruning got a couple more here that I want to remove. If there's young peppers on the plant at the time, you know you can leave these guys until they get big. And then you've got, and you can also, one of the ways that you can tell when they're getting there is the color changes a little bit. 
this is a this is a much uh, lighter color this is a little bit more uh, darker color so this one I'm going to go ahead and take two and that plant is going to continue to produce well into September uh, once again with the heat moisture and make sure that uh, if you with with your vegetable plants if you don't want to use a mulch you can also use a newspaper as long as it doesn't have colored ink the last thing that I wanted to talk about as far as the harvest is concerned is garlic. Now, unfortunately, we had some really, really hot weather. So I had to harvest the garlic early. Otherwise, it would not have, it would, it would have rotted. Um, so I have my garlic here and it's about a week. It's about a week into um, drying out is what you want it to do. Now, interestingly, this garlic plant has stayed green. Everything else has turned brown. This one has stayed green. The reason this one has stayed green is it is taking its own energy from the bulb and pushing it back up in order to save this seed pod. This seed pod has hundreds of baby garlic. And if you were to plant each one of these, they would each produce a garlic plant for you. But what we really want is this part. So once you've harvested your garlic, you want to leave this in place. And you want all of this to turn brown as it has. You can, if you want, you can hang it. Or you can hang it. Some people will hang it upside down. I prefer to hang it like this. Once everything has dried up nice and dry, you want to make a cut right above the bulb. You don't want to cut into the actual clothes. Cut right above the bulb. And then, and this is garlic that was grown in our garden. And if you could smell, <laughs> this is heaven. And there. So, I know that some of you may have some questions um, before we move on to what to do with errant plants. Um, if there's any questions that are coming through. Yes, uh, yes Derek, we have a couple questions. Um, the first okay. one is from Ms. Hall. Can lavender be grown in a late garden? If so, what is the best way to start a lavender plant? Okay, um, let me get a lavender plant. So the best way to start a lavender plant is to buy one that's already been started. Uh, you could try to start lavender from seed, but it's a little bit too late. So you can get something like this at the garden center. Uh, lavender doesn't really root very well off of itself. You would have to do a process like with the oregano and push it down and, and stake it in place and then it would root. But you can start with a small plant like this. If you're growing lavender indoors, on a windowsill, what you may end up seeing is that the inside leaves start to turn very dry. Um, if you're growing it outdoors, you can put it outdoors now. The big thing about lavender, you can use it in cooking. A lot of French foods actually use lavender in cooking, more the blossoms than the leaves. You can use it as a garnish. So you could put this on a plate as a garnish. You can use it for the aromatic properties that it has. But the big thing about lavender, do not prune lavender after Labor Day. The reason being is lavender is a true sub shrub. And in this area, every time you prune your lavender plant, it doesn't know or doesn't care, I should say, what season we're going into. So if I were to do this in October, the plant, instead of going dormant, would start to produce sugars again and would start to grow again and could potentially kill itself because it's growing at a time when it needs to be dormant. So do any pruning that you wanna do with the lavender. Plant it out now if you can get it at a garden center, but um, make sure that you do not prune it in late fall. And uh, the other thing about lavender is always plant it high. It does not like to be in a boggy, wet condition. Um, Derek, can you, um, can grocery store herbs be used to start a garden? Absolutely, if they have roots. Like the basil that you see in grocery stores, you can use that to start a garden. Um, uh, oregano, 
may root if it's not, if it hasn't been chilled too much. Um, but any of the herbs that you see in the grocery store, if it has a root, it can. When you see fennel, which is a big bulb, if you plant that, unfortunately, it's just gonna shoot up a flower stalk. Um, if you see dill, sometimes they have dill plants that, are, that have the root in place, you could do that. Um, but basil is the one that you see more often than not where they have the entire plant. You can take that plant, you can plant it in a garden, just be minded that the plant leaves are gonna probably burn out because they're not acclimated to the full sun. When that happens, it will flush out like the basil plant that I pruned, and it will produce new leaves that are acclimated to the sun. And how do you prevent hot pepper blossom drop? Um, so these peppers have not enjoyed a 90 plus weather so far. A lot of plants. Um, if you look at these, <laughs> if you look at these wonderful tomatoes, I did heirloom tomatoes this year. And what do we have? We have a lot of green and no fruit. There's two down here actually <laughs> that I'm hoping make it. Uh, there's supposed to be a green tomato, but we've got a lot of fungus going on. We've got a lot of blossom rot going on. <sighs> you know, there are uh, things like neem oil that you could put in the garden, which is a antifungal and it's organic. Um, there are organic sprays that you can put on to prevent blossom rot. Um, I would say research what's available at your local garden center. Um, the other thing that you can try to do is do a little bit of the newspaper mulch that I talked about because that helps to prevent the splashing. Like when we get these late afternoon thunderstorms, those are really, really harsh on the blossoms too. But the big thing that you want to try to do is get an organic one there to break the cycle of the fungal uh, disease that's causing the blossom rot. And we have time for about two more questions. So the first one is, what is the best way of starting gardening? What kind of sapling should I um, choose, local or something different? The best way of starting is just jumping right in. You've got you've to start, and Katrina, you know this, I talk about this all the time. You've got to start with good soil. So you've got to get your soil in order. And um, the person that asked that question, if, if they send an email to uh, someone at the museum, we can send them a, a, one of the pamphlets that we've done on soil care. So get your soil in order. If you haven't planted the, veg, the vegetable garden yet, what you're actually gonna be preparing the soil for is a fall garden, which seeds and things like that, we're gonna be planting that at the August workshop. So we're gonna be talking about that at the August workshop. But right now is the time to get the place in order. You want a spot that's gonna have six hours of sun at minimum every day during the summer. You wanna make sure that the spot is well drained, but also holds moisture. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but you wanna make sure that when you're watering the spot, the water is going into the earth, but also you wanna make sure that the water is not sitting on the earth. Um, and you wanna make sure that if you wanna start out with plants now, some of the uh, big box um, uh, hardware stores, they've got mature plants that are, already have fruit on it. Once you get your soil in order, go ahead, plant a tomato, plant a pepper plant. Um, you've still got enough time to harvest those now. Anything by seed that's a summer vegetable, those should have been started actually in February. So get the soil in order and look forward to the next workshop where we will talk about what we can plant. Um, would you recommend moving potted herbs inside during heat waves? Uh, no, I'd recommend that you make sure they don't dry out during heat wave. And I'd make sure if you see that the herbs are starting to lose a lot of leaves. As a matter of fact, I'll show you this lavender plant. This happened to this lavender plant during the last heat wave. This was not about the heat as it was about the excessive moisture that was being left on the plant. So you have to diagnose what the problem is. If your herbs seem like they're having some trouble, it could be because the pot that you have them in is too small. If the pot is too small, then make sure you pot it up to the next size. And the next size shouldn't be but about two inches larger and two inches deeper than what you've currently got going. The other thing that you wanna make sure is that if it's a heat wave, you have to water. Sometimes my potted plants, during the last couple of weeks, I've had to water them twice a day. So make sure you're not drying them out. 
If things are turning yellow when, they're, when the leaves are going bad, it's because of not enough water. If they're turning black like this, it's because of too much water. So the plant kind of tells you what's going on, but your herbs should absolutely love this heat. And do we have time for one more question during, during this segment? Um, how do you best protect your plants from pests and insects? <laughs> um, it, it varies. It depends on the pest. You know, this, this, this year we saw a tomato hornworm that was literally, it had to be a six inch tomato hornworm. And by the time we found it, it had completely stripped one of the tomatoes. So, you know, there's a lot of organic treatments that you can do for pests. There's a, uh, what's called an all seasons oil. Basically it's a mineral oil. If you see that you have pests, you can spray that, um, use it as directed. You can do the neem oil, which I mentioned before. Um, you can also use sometimes just going and giving it a good drink of water will take care of things like spider mites, which tend to only be on the underside of leaves. So like if you think you have spider mites, you want to look at the underside of the leaf. And when you're watering, you want to make sure the water is getting underneath here. Um, but it depends on what the pest is. There's not one solution for all pest. Um, uh, the other thing is, is that if you have healthy soil, the plants tend to not be as attractive to the pests. When your plants are in peril, they actually attract more pests. So start with compost, start with leaf grow, start with doing organic soil amendments so that your garden actually starts from the root up. Okay, so I'm ready for the next segment and then we'll have another round of questioning in about 15 minutes or so. Okay, perfect. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk with everyone is this time of the year is also a time when, uh, at least I do, most gardeners do, we start to look at, at we, we, we edit, we look at what's, 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 what, what worked, what didn't. And um, I have a hard time sometimes pulling up plants that are volunteers. Um, so like this arugula plant, we did not plant it. But this is, this is a really, really, really wonderful arugula. This is a wild arugula. Um, now, this one I'm going to leave because where it's growing, it's not going to really mess with anything. What I am going to do so that it started to go to, to flower, which means I'll have more arugula plants. So what I am going to do, I am going to cut this one back um, because this one is a volunteer. I did not plant it. I'm going to cut it back. Now, if you, if you harvest arugula, now, it will be the spiciest arugula that you've ever had because arugula, uh, the temperature is controlled by the heat. And so this will be very, very spicy, but this will be wonderful in a salad this evening. What you're eating, you're not eating the woody part, of course, you're just eating the leafy part. So I'm going to put this in our harvest basket. And I'm going to leave that one. But... This guy that's in here is actually another volunteer. Now there's a baby that's in there that I wanna to try to save. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this one out. I'm gonna get rid of that one. And then I'm gonna leave this baby. And the reason I'm gonna leave this baby is by the time this sunflower is done, which the birds have already started eating, you can see they've been, they've been pecking at it. We had a cardinal in the garden this morning. Uh, so they've been pecking at the seeds and getting the seeds. Once the birds are finished eating the sunflowers, uh, what I will have is a, a winter garden here and arugula will be part of that. So I may have to transplant this young one, but I'm leaving that one. I took out the one that was, a, was an errant volunteer. In the garden, anything, a weed is defined as anything that was not planted by you. So anything that you did not plant that has come up that you've endured, that you didn't want to weed, this might be the time of year to go ahead and think about getting rid of it. The other thing that I'm looking at that hasn't done well, and it could be location. You saw the giant cucumbers that we were harvesting from one location. This other location this year, these cucumbers have not done well at all. And the blossom and rot that one of the, uh, one of the folks was talking about has really plagued these cucumbers. Now, if you look here, here's a little tiny one. 
And what I've been what I've been experiencing is before these get to be anything, they drop off. So I'm not sure what's happening with this particular cucumber patch this year, but it's not thriving. So that could be something that you put on your edit list. That could be something that you remove because it's not doing well. Other things that you would want to get rid of in the garden. We talked about this lavender plant. I think this lavender plant has succumbed to overwatering. However, it could be disease. So I'm gonna get rid of this plant too because this plant is right next to it. And this is the one we, we did some cuttings on. So what I don't want is if this is sick with something, I don't want it to be passed on to this plant. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be keeping this, keep the good out with the bad. And for the ornamental garden, you can make the same decisions. So if there were things that didn't do well, you can either dig them up, you can transplant them, or you can, if, if it's too many, you can give them, give them away. I have an oregano patch here, and repeatedly what I do with it is I will reduce the size of this, and I will also reduce the mass. And when I reduce the mass, I just go in there kind of nilly-willy, cut away at it. So I have some oregano. I'm gonna make a really nice oregano pesto with this. And then we've kind of controlled it. What I wanna do is bring it back in bounds here. So I'm gonna bring it all the way back so that it's within bounds and it's well behaved. And then any of the leaves and stuff that are left over, you can clean that up. You can go ahead and put that in the compost bin. Also, with any of your woody vegetables or fruit, like grape plants. This time of year, I've got two grape plants here. And what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna kind of take an assessment of what you're gonna keep and what you're gonna get rid of. These plants will be ready this fall to actually be put on an arbor. And what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that what I'm looking at is first of all, anything that's spent, I'm gonna take off. Um, this piece here is actually going to, and there's a, there's a pest, that's a slug. And so when you have slugs in the garden, they're the ones that put holes in the garden. And you can just, if you crunch it, put it back into the soil, circle of life. What you wanna do here though, you see this, this grapevine, I wanna actually, um, this got damaged somehow, but next year it'll be fine. But I've got two really healthy pieces coming off of here. And on this one, right, it's growing errant. I'm going to go ahead and take this away so it's not part of the equation when I put it up on the trellis. And then the same thing here. I want to look at this and make sure that everything that I've got here, and I've done some pruning to this, this here, for some reason this has died out. What I don't want to do is have the plant trying to give energy to this here. So as we're cleaning up, cleaning house, getting rid of volunteers, we're also removing parts of plants that we know aren't going to work. And that's how we do our housekeeping at this time of the year to the garden. Ultimately, the other thing we're going to talk about is the tomato plant. And this tomato plant, as I said, has overproduced leaves and not a lot of fruit. And it's because of the blossom end rot. What I don't want the plant to do is to waste a lot of energy any, any longer on overproducing leaves. So there's a lot of stems that this plant has that are not necessary. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to actually remove this entire limb. So I've taken all of this out. This does not have any fruit. This may not have any fruit. And it's a bigger mass of plant that I have to get under control to get the blossom rot under control. I'm reducing the plant. This piece here, I think I can actually put back into the cage so that it's well behaved. And then some of these lower leaves 
I will also turn off because now I'm going to be able to keep the bottom area clean. The other plant here has another large limb that is really an errant limb. I want to go ahead and take that off all the way at the bottom. I don't know if we can get a shot all the way in here. All the way at the bottom from where it came off. I'm going to take that out. Then I'm going to pull that out. And what we've done by doing that is we're also taking away some of the energy that the plant has to produce to maintain this plant. And hopefully what I've left behind is going to be stronger and it's going to actually set blossoms uh, that will produce what we really want from our tomato plants, which is the fruit. Do we have any questions about cleaning up the garden, uh, pruning in the summer garden or anything like that, Katrina? Um, so we have two questions from the last batch I want to get to first. Okay. Um, so the first question is about squash. Sean writes, my squash seems to not be producing a lot of female flowers. Should I be patient or try to intervene in the process? How many plants do you have? Squash plants have to cross pollinate. Um, there's a misnomer about female flowers. Um, what you want to do is when you plant squash plants, you plant them on a hill. What that means is you create a mound of earth. Uh, the reason that you do that is because they, they grow apart. So if you create a mound of earth, you can get four or five squash plants in an area that you normally wouldn't because you've gone up a bit. You plant them on a hill, you want to put in four or five squash plants because when one blossom is open and there's no other blossoms open, it will not produce a squash because it, the bees don't have pollen to take from one flower to the other flower. And so they have to cross pollinate. The plants, you have to have more than one plant. If you have one plant, you'll never get squash, even if you have multiple flowers, because you don't have a flower open on two different plants. Your neighbor might get some because the bees may go to your neighbor's plant um, and pollinate theirs, but you won't. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have more than one squash plant. Uh, it's better to plant at least four, perhaps five, and, and, and deal with it that way. Um, so Miss Gordon has a question about her cucumber. So I let my cucumber vines overgrow. I've pruned them back. The leaves are huge, up to two feet across. I'm still getting cukes. Do you have any suggestions for next summer? If you're still getting cukes, you've done okay. I mean, it, it, it's, like I said, my, I have one cucumber patch of the exact same cucumbers that are not producing at all. And to me, that's a bigger problem. If you look at this plant, the, the leaves are huge, but we'll go back and prove one more. But the cucumbers are magnificent. <laughs> so the fact that the leaves got big this year, it's okay. If it's a space situation, you may want to try a compact cucumber. You may want to try a cucumber that is suited for a smaller space but the fact that you've got cucumbers and you've got a good plant bravo uh so this is a follow-up on the squash um the mm -hmm. female flowers on my squash plant never bloom they die off before they bloom even the lots of male flowers bloom why would this be it's it might be i mean once again your squash has to cross pollinate if the female flowers are never opening up it could be a location issue it could be a fungal issue. There's a number of things that can, um, can be the bane of squash. I think the thing to do is next year, do not plant in the same spot because whatever pathogen was there may still be there. So if there's another spot in the garden that you can plant, try that. You may wanna try changing out the soil. You may wanna try amending the soil, um, but it's, it's hit or miss with squash. I've, I've stopped planting it just because our, our climate is such that the zucchini squash does really, really well. The yellow crookneck, which is what I like, eh, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, but if you want to do the squash, try it in another place next year. If the female blossoms are not opening up, you may want to try uh, researching what's the best um, uh, organic spray that you can use 
it's a, it sounds like something's wrong with the blossoms. It could be a mite that's, that's eating into the blossom. It could be a, a number of things. Without actually seeing the plant, it's hard to diagnose. Mm -hmm. um, I let the heirloom tomato I planted overgrow, but I've pruned it. It still isn't producing fruit. Is there anything to do? Uh, you shouldn't have pruned it because heirloom tomato plants produce frightfully small yields. Um, they are old variety of tomatoes that, you know, sometimes with a brandywine tomato, you may only get six or eight tomatoes. Uh, if you've pruned it back, just be patient. Hopefully between now and September, you'll get blossoms that will set. You will get fruit that will actually get to being ripe. And if we have a, if we have a, um, a mild fall, uh, you could leave the tomato plants in through October. Uh, so hopefully you'll get something, but you don't want to prune back the entire plant on a tomato plant, whether it's indeterminate or determinate. De indeterminate means it just continues to grow. Determinate means it only grows a certain height. Regardless of what it is, you don't ever want to prune back the entire tomato plant because it has to start the whole process of growth and then blossoming all over again. Are there plants or herbs that you would recommend to keep, um, for keeping mosquitoes away? Um, the quote unquote mosquito plant is a geranium plant. If you wanted to roll in the geranium plant, uh, it would keep the mosquitoes away. A really easy tincture that you can make yourself that is good for kids, it's good for you. You use um, a base of um, lavender witch hazel. You can get that at most of the secondary grocery stores. Uh, so a base of lavender witch hazel, you can order it online too. And then you want to use essential oil of geranium, essential oil of lavender, essential oil of lemongrass. And you want to mix in a, one of the small squirt bottles. You want to mix, almost fill the squirt bottle with the lavender witch hazel and put about 10 drops of the lemongrass, lavender, and geranium oil into that mixture, mix it around, and you can spray it on yourself, and the mosquitoes will not be attracted to you for several hours. And one last question before we move on to our next segment. What kind of plants can attract birds? Um, well, birds come for things like the sunflowers. Um, so, as I said, and as a matter of fact, if you look right up here, we didn't put the sunflower up here, but I'm sure a bird did. And uh, we might have interrupted. Well, no, actually, you see, it got the seed out of it. So this sunflower plant, and if we can get a shot around the front, uh, they've just discovered that those seeds are ready to go. And I will not take one of those sunflower seeds away. The birds will eat them all. And we've got more ripening up top. So sunflowers are a really good attractant to birds. Also, if you want uh, plants like hummingbirds, red flowers usually attract them, but the flowers that we were at at the very beginning, which are the blue sage, I don't know if it's too far up that we can't get a shot right now. That blue sage is a wonderful. This will attract hummingbirds. Um, and then, uh, there is, um, if you like, goldfinches. Um, I think we have time. Let's run up to the front of the garden. So if you plant coneflower, which is echinacea, this plant, when this seed pod becomes mature, the goldfinches, they will literally be fighting each other, each other over these seeds. So birds are gonna come into your garden for uh, habitat. So if you have big shrubs like this that they can hide in to produce their nests in. Um, we even had a song sparrow produce a nest in one of these topiaries last year because it was a really nice covered area. So they want shelter. And then if you have food, like things that produce seeds, most of the times it's the seed plants that the birds come after. And when it's really, really hot in the summer, maybe give them a little bit of water. I don't recommend feeding the birds because you also attract vermin.
Okay, let's move on to the next segment and then we'll have questioning at the end. Okay. So for our next segment, what we're talking about is caring for ornamental plants. The first thing that I wanted to talk about, however, is a plant that's sort of an ornamental plant. It's a plant that a lot of people don't really grow around here, but I tend to love them, and that's a persimmon. Now, a persimmon is a Japanese fruit, uh, or an Asian fruit, I should say, um, and they're really lovely. This is still very immature. It's not gonna be mature until September. But most persimmons that we have available these days are grafted. And one of my trees, I've got three of them, that's one variety and this is, this is a second variety. What has happened here, the wild tree that it's grafted to has, has taken over because this tree has had some, some health problems this year. So what I wanna do, and I would have done this sooner but I knew we were gonna have this segment, I want to, and you can see the white flies, which is a secondary pest, actually, that we've got to control. I want to um, go ahead and remove all of this off of here because that vegetation is only taking energy from this plant. Now, ornamental plants, that's basically what we're talking about in this segment. And at this time of the year, it's a really good time to check in on your ornamental plants. Things like the cone flower that we were talking about up front, if they started to fall over, you wanna stake them. But also you wanna look at things that you've got, quote unquote, in the, in the, in the hopper, in the works. Um, this is a Rebecca plant, Black Eyed Susan. It's got a lot of babies down here. But what we actually did with the mother plants, was we created some babies. So what we did was we took off, we dug out some of these babies and we potted them in here. And I just wanna check and see how they're doing. And so what I'm actually gonna do, and this one I can tell you is doing really, really well because I've already seen some roots coming out of the bottom. But I'm gonna squeeze the pot. see how well that's rooting in. So see that's rooting in really well. Actually it's rooting in too well. So what I want to do is I want to cut all of these roots away because what's going to happen is it's going to become a mass of roots and pretty soon the water will not be getting absorbed by the plant. I'm going to drop the plant back in there this type of plant we can do a top dressing on. A top dressing is just putting some additional soil across the top. And now this plant, I'll do the same thing to this one afterwards, is going to be ready to put out into the garden probably around early September. And next year it'll produce flowers like the mother plant is doing. And as you can see, while we were talking, a bee almost came over, um, but I moved the plant and so she went her way. Um, ivy plants. Ivy gets a really, really bad rap, but ivy is really, really good if you're going to be controlling it. It's one of the most forgiving plants. So this cutting I started in early spring and you can see it's got where the original plant was. It's got a bunch of babies coming off of it. This one I really like using at holiday time for decoration in your pots and things like that. So what I did was I took cuttings off of the mother plant and I started, and you can just, with ivy, you can just stick them straight in the ground. I stuck them straight in the ground. One has taken, this one has not. And this one has not. So I've got one plant there. In the next couple of months, it's gonna flush out like this. And that's gonna be really 
attractive in our fall uh, ornamental planter displays. And so you want to check on these guys. Now see this one, you can see the baby right behind my finger there. You can see the baby leaf coming in. That tells me that's rooted. That, you know, I see some new growth coming in, so I know that's rooted. But I want to check and see if this one has. It has not. The reason we're removing these is because we don't want these to rot in the, in the, in the container. Uh, a container is a very, um, it's a, you know, it's a restrictive vessel. And so I don't want rot happening along baby plants. So that's one of the housekeeping things that we can do. Now this one, for some reason, looks like it started and then it, it, it went, yeah, so it didn't take either. And you can see it did produce a little bit of root and then it died off. So we've got that housekeeping done. And the last thing is if you have plants that have bloomed in pots, container gardens have become really popular. Someone was asking about uh, herbs and you know what they can do in the heat. Well, in the heat, what you want to make sure is that your pots are not overcrowded with roots. So what I'm going to do is this daylily, it's a really nice uh, white flowered daylily in the summer. Um, it has bloomed. So what I'm going to actually do is take it out of the small pot. I'm going to pull apart the roots. I'm going to put it into some pure pro mix. I'm also going to give it a haircut because right now I don't need all of this foliage. And if I do this, it's going to flush out a whole new set of foliage for me. Just really compact that soil when you put it in there. Always plant it a little bit lower than, I can add a little more. Always plant it a little bit lower than the rim of the pot. You don't want to fill it all the way to the rim because then that way when you're watering, you can fill the pot. The rim, this area can fill up with water and then that water can move through the plant. And that way you're making sure that you're watering the plants well. So that's about it for the housekeeping of our ornamental plants. Katrina, do we have more questions that have yes, come in? Yes, we do. Um, so very quickly, back to your sunflowers. Um, Ms. Forbes, I love your sunflowers. Will the <laughs> seeds produce new sunflowers if planted next year? The seeds will, if you save them, produce sunflowers that can be planted next year. What you have to do is you have to beat the birds to it. So once the yellow has completely gone away from the plant, and if you come back down to this one, we can see all this has faded. And when these, each one of these were an individual pistil and stamen, so it was, it was an individual um, flowering part of the plant, the actual part that we like is just to attract insects to the plant. Once the insects get close enough, they get their nectar and they pollinate be, by, by each one of these individual little buttons. So when you do this, this all comes out. And then what you do is you want to harvest your sunflowers. You run your fingers across there. And there you go, Miss Forbes. These are your seeds. What you want to do is you want to make sure you put them on a paper towel to dry out for about a week. And then afterwards, you want to store them for about a month in a paper bag. And then after that month, you can put them into a plastic bag. The reason being is you don't want the shell. There's moisture in the shell. You don't want that moisture to rot the seed inside. So a week in a paper towel, about a month in a paper bag, and then move it into a plastic bag because you want to maintain the moisture of the seed itself. This is just the shell. Now, if the birds beat you to it, what they're coming after is that really, really fabulous inner seed. So that's what the birds are coming after. They want that, you know, so they, they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> and if you wait, you can wait until these pieces turn completely brown before you harvest the seed. How long does it take for the ivy to root? 
uh, about a week to 14 days, depending on temperature, depending on how much you water it. Um, but when you do it outside in the summer, it should root within about 14 days. And, and if you cut it off of someone else's ivy, sometimes when you cut it off of someone else's ivy, if you've got one second, I'll show you. If you've got young fleshy roots like that, those roots are ready to go. So those are already rooted. So if you were to take an ivy plant, I don't think I'll be able to break it. I'll, I, my pruners are over there. But if you, if you take an, the ivy plant, any of this is already rooted. So if you take something that's in the air, not so much because that root has dried out. But if it's got a, a young fleshy root, you can stick that in and it's already rooted. So it's ready to go. When is the best time to prune bushes? I think I'm back. We had a okay. technical difficulty. Okay. <laughs> we, we had a phone overheat. So, um, as though it's not hot out here. Um, so uh, I don't know how much you heard of that, but if you do have an ivy plant that already has roots, you can go ahead and you're good to go. Uh, if not, it's going to be 10 to 14 days. Okay. And so um, when would be the best time to prune bushes? Uh, wait until the fall at this point. If you... If you have to prune them because a neighbor is saying that it's in their way or whatever, then you have to prune them. But the best time right now is to wait to prune your bushes until the fall. And so we have a couple more questions I just want to get to. Anyone who can stay is welcome to stay. Um, so let's see very quickly. So um, I planted a native iris in June well after it had bloomed. Should I give it a haircut or it die back in the fall? Um, The most popular native iris is the flag iris, which is a yellow iris. It's trying to find a small pot of it. We can go back into the sun. Um, so irises are not finicky. Where, if it bloomed, you want to take that off. If it's kind of messy looking to you right now what you can do with iris at this time of the year july is the best time because their roots have actually gone dormant they've done all the energy sourcing that they needed so if you want and prefer to have an iris plant that looks like that in your garden you can leave it and do it like that it will produce some new leaves that will not be as messy as these. But this is the native flag iris. And to wrap up, a question um, I think is really important for, um, to get to know you a bit more. So what does gardening mean to you and how did you become involved in gardening for our new attendees? Um, one of my earliest memories of my grandfather was I had a patch in his garden in Trinidad and Tobago where I had a pineapple. And he taught me how to cut the top off of the pineapple, dry it, and once it was dry, we planted it. And months and months and months later, I was a kid, so it seemed like forever, I had a pineapple. Um, and that was my introduction to gardening. Gardening has been in blood ever since. Um, what gardening means to me is that when we were getting ready for the segment, I was standing in the heat. It's, it's warm. 
and I got to stand and look at my salvia plants providing food for honeybees. And I plant sunflowers every year because it's what I do. Um, it, 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 it's my sustenance. It's, it's what, it, what gardening is what keeps me going. And I have plants in the house. <laughs> my house can be a bit of a, of a freak show with how many plants I have. And um, it's just what I do. It's, it's what I've always loved. And I'm very, very blessed because I get to do what I love every day. And another quick question. You showed some yellow peppers earlier. Um, were they the same as banana peppers? No, they were shishito peppers, actually. Um, and the shishito peppers, what you would do is you would saute them. Um, and you do a little bit of oil, saute them. The interesting thing about a shishito pepper, most of them are mild. And every once in a while, there's one that packs a kick. So <laughs> if you're not an adventurous, uh, you may want to stay away from them because every once in a while, there's one that'll say, hello, I'm here. Uh, but they're mostly a mild pepper and they're mostly grown for their very, very, very intense flavor. So last call for one last question. Going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, so um, there, once again, thank you so much um, for leading this session. Um, we're very excited to see you back, have you back um, as you move to our new normal in terms of virtual I'm, gardening. I'm, this was, this like made my month. So, <laughs> so thank you, <laughs> Katrina, Janelle, and, Linda. <laughs> and for our attendees, thank you so much for um, spending a portion of your Saturday morning with us. We will be back August 29th as we look toward the fall harvest. Any questions you have in terms of the gardening program, feel free to email me at Lashley, L-A-S-H-L-E-Y-K at si.edu, and I'll pass any questions you have on to Derek. So once again, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll be back next month, so we hope that you'll be back as well. Um, take care, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Stay safe. Bye-bye.